Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth webinar in our series. My name is Anuth Naushan, Project Manager of Courage to Act. Courage to Act is a two-year national initiative to address and prevent gender-based violence in post-secondary campuses in Canada. It builds on the key recommendations within Possibility Seed's vital report, Courage to Act, developing a national framework to prevent and address gender-based violence at post-secondary institutions. Our project is the first national collaborative of its kind to bring together experts and advocates from across Canada to end gender-based violence on campus. A key feature of our project is our free webinar series, where we invite leading experts to discuss key concepts and share promising practices on ending gender-based violence on campus. Supported by Caucus, these webinars are also a recognized learning opportunity. Attendance at 10 or more live webinars will count towards an online certificate. Our project is made possible through generous support and funding for the Department for Women and Gender Equality Wage, Federal Government of Canada. And we begin today's webinar by acknowledging that this work is taking place on and across the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. We recognize that gender-based violence is one form of violence caused by colonization to marginalize and dispossess Indigenous peoples from their lands and waters. Our project strives to honor this truth as we work towards decolonizing this work and actualizing justice for missing and murdered ind Indigenous women and girls across the country. I want to pause now and invite everyone to take a deep breath. This work can be challenging and this topic hard. Many of us may have our own experience of survivorship and of supporting those we love and care about who have experienced gender-based violence. So a gentle reminder here to be attentive to our well-being as we engage these hard conversations. And before I introduce our speakers today, a brief note on the format. Melanie and Kate will speak for 40 minutes and I invite you to enter questions and comments into the question and answer box. And I will monitor this and together we will pose these questions to Melanie and Kate at the end of the presentation. This will happen in the last 15 minutes. At the end of the webinar, you will find a link to the evaluation forum. We'd be grateful if you take a few minutes to share your feedback as it helps us improve. This is anonymous. Following the webinar, I will also email you with a copy of the evaluation form and a link to the recording so you can review and share the webinar with your networks. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Melanie Kretkington works as a case manager with Simon Fraser University's Sexual Violence Support and Prevention Office. Melanie holds a Master's of Social Work from UBC with postgraduate training in trauma work. Her scope of work has included clinical and consultative social work in acute healthcare settings and in private practice. A particular area of interest has been providing counseling to women impacted by sexual violence. Melanie previously worked as an international student advisor within higher education. Thank you for joining us, Melanie. And Kate Parnell is a sexual health educator and academic program coordinator at Fraser International College at Simon Fraser University. Kate comes from an academic background in sexuality studies and has more than a decade of experience as a sexual health educator with a particular focus on youth engagement, LGBTQ plus empowerment, and sexuality education for international students in higher education. Currently, she designs and implements sexual health, sexual violence prevention, and well-being curriculum and transition programming for international students at Fraser International College. Welcome, Kate. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to our speakers. All right, thank you very much, Anuth, for that warm welcome. Hello, everybody. And um, what we're gonna be doing in terms of format is we're on video right now, but we're actually gonna turn our video off before we get started. Um, for recording purposes for the webinar. And then at the very end, when we address questions, we'll pop our video back on so we can have more of a conversation. So video off, but we'll get started on the presentation. So in terms of what we're gonna be talking about today, um, at FIC and SFU, uh, we've long been supporting students on international pathways, as I'm sure many of you have as well in our educational and our support programs. And we're familiar with the barriers that many of our students are facing and the issues that they bring to us. We wanted to do something to address these barriers and improve our services in the community. 
Um, so we decided to set out on a multi-year collaborative project to bring light to the barriers faced by our students on international pathways and develop best practices and initiatives for our communities. So this presentation will primarily focus on th this project and what we learned from it. Um, and I also just wanted to mention quickly that in our title, we use the, the phrase gender-based violence, um, but in this project, we've specifically targeted sexual violence as one form of gender-based violence that many students on international pathways face. So in terms of what we'll get to, we'll talk about uh, our schools, SFU and FIC, and our context. We'll do a brief introduction to the project, which we call the IP project, do a quick overview of definitions, We'll talk about our key findings from our literature review, talk about our two-stage community engagement process, our conclusions, and then the stage that we're at right now, which is actually taking action. So our work at FIC and at SFU takes place on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Tsleil-Waututh, Kukwetlem, Musqueam, Squamish, Kwantlen, Semiamu, Sawasan, Kakite, and Katsi nations. And we wanted to acknowledge our place as settlers, but also the place of anti-violence work on stolen indigenous land. Sexual violence has been at the core of the settler colonial agenda that displaces and disenfranchises indigenous peoples. And as we work with settlers on international pathways in this project, we strive to center anti-colonialism and anti-racism on our path to end gender-based violence. We also wanted to acknowledge the current revolution that we're witnessing and participating in right now. And we position ourselves as learners, along with many of our students. Anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, and the colonial violence of Canada are entrenched in the institutions that we are a part of, the cities that we call home, and the fabric of our lives here on the West Coast. As services working to support students on international pathways, it's imperative that we center the immense amounts of reflection and learning and importantly change that is currently taking place. We support Black, Indigenous, and people of color's lives, and we recognize that liberation from sexual violence cannot take place without an end to white supremacy and anti-Black racism. With that in mind, let's go a bit more in depth into our specific context at our schools. Thanks, Kate. SFU is located in British Columbia on the West Coast in Canada and has built a reputation for its community engagement and outreach. It's a university with three urban campuses in Metro Vancouver, and we have 30,000 students and about 6,500 faculty and staff. A little bit about our SFU context on the next slide. These graphs provide information on our, our undergraduate international students. This past fall, over 5,300 undergrad international students registered at SFU. International students represent a little over 20% of our total undergrad population, and close to 50% of our international undergrads are from China. On the next slide, these are the graphs that provide information on our graduate international student population. This past fall, over 1,500 graduate international students registered at SFU. International students make up over 32% of our graduate student population, and students from China, India, Iran, and the US make up about 66% of our international graduate population. The Sexual Violence Support and Prevention Office, which we'll be referring to as the SVSPO, is the university central hub providing supports, education, and leadership concerning sexual violence and sexual misconduct. And recognizing that consent matters, people who experience sexual violence are empowered to take the lead in deciding what is right for them, and the SVSBO is there to support them through their process. And we've currently shifted to remote working options in a COVID context. 
So Fraser International College, or FIC as we'll be referring to it, is a private pathway program that's on SFU campus. Uh, so probably many of you have a college like this at your university. And um, we have about two to 3,000 students at any given time from about 92 different countries. And uh, it's primarily first year students, which means that the majority of students that we're working with have recently arrived in Canada, sometimes a day before school starts, um, sometimes within the past year, but they're uh, generally students who have recently arrived to Canada. There was awareness and recognition of the barriers for students in accessing sexual violence support services and engaging in educational initiatives and even more so for vulnerable populations such as international students. And as Kate mentioned earlier, we were curious to learn more about how we may address the barriers. And in fall 2018, the SVSPO partnered with International Services for Students and FIC and created a working group to collaborate further the SVSPO has also hired a series of really dedicated work study and co-op students since that time to support the project. And initial conversations amongst our working group really informed the decision to expand the scope of the international student group we were looking at to include students from a range of international pathways. And when we looked at those stats, it suggested a much higher percentage of our student population, closer to over 50%. And this included permanent residents, refugees, international students, and even Canadians who may have been previously living abroad. The goals of the International Pathway Project that we'll refer to as the IP Project have been to learn more about IP students' knowledge of sexual health issues, to identify barriers that IP students face when accessing sexual violence support and education, to create more accessibility to the support and education and to create an evidence informed action plan to create more inclusive programming at both SFU and FIC. A little bit about the project structure. It included an initial literature review followed by a two stage community engagement process. The first stage consisted of conversations with campus community partners to gather their perspectives on barriers and the second stage was to survey SFU and FIC IP students. After that, we were able to review the findings, which informed our next steps and creating an action plan. Focusing in on our working definition, I've shared how those initial conversations informed expanding the scope of the demographic we were looking at to include students from a range of international pathways who were newcomers to Canada. We also had to determine the length of time when we talked about being a newcomer, and we eventually landed on the time frame of a newcomer who has arrived in Canada within the last eight years. And we defined these parameters based on a number of factors, discussions on findings in the lit review on the settlement experience, conversations about students who were direct transfer students from high school or else entering university directly from overseas, um, findings from the internal consultation process, as well as the lived experiences of the working group members themselves. Many of us are already in, involved in the work, but in case you're new to the field, we define sexual violence as an umbrella term that encompasses a broad range of behavior. It means a sexual act or an act targeting a person's sexuality, gender identity, or gender expression without the person's consent. Such behavior may or may not involve physical contact, and it includes but is not limited to sexual assault, sexual exploitation, sexual harassment, stalking, indecent exposure, voyeurism, stealthing, and the distribution of sexually explicit photographs or videos of a person without their consent. So we started uh, this project with a lit review, which was short, uh, because as we probably many of us are familiar with, there's very little current research on IP students. Uh, but the lit review that we did do confirmed essentially what we already knew from our experience uh, as frontline workers. So the research that we did find showed that, unsurprisingly, international students often face many barriers to disclosing 
uh, or reporting sexual violence. It also showed that there was a lack of understanding of what actually constitutes sexual violence and that there is a pretty strong um, level of fear around disclosure and how that connects to student visas and what actually confidentiality looks like. We also were able to find that most current uh, sexual violence education content is not culturally sensitive and it doesn't often meet the needs or center the needs of students on international pathways. We also looked at kind of parallel uh, areas of research that could help inform our practices, uh, such as research highlighting the experiences of immigrant and refugee folks. And we found that immigrant and refugee women specifically are more vulnerable to gender-based violence because of isolation that they may uh, experience from family and community. So we tried to look at these parallel areas and, and see what we could learn that could inform our best practices. The first stage of the community engagement process took place over the fall 2018 term, and it involved consultations with key campus community partners. They were about one hour meetings co-facilitated by our work study student and another SVSBO staff member. And these are the various campus partners we connected with. The first question we asked on the next slide was around the barriers the staff member had identified in IP students accessing sexual violence support services on campus, and if they could share with us any trends they'd noticed. These were some of the main responses. A lack of awareness of the existence of the SVSPO, stigma around accessing support services or other counseling services on campus, students from some cultures where it's not encouraged to talk about their problems or reach out for help externally, where more value is placed on family and social support systems, and that the individuals who did access external services may be stigmatized. Lack of diversified staffing in student services offices also came up as students may be uncomfortable relating with staff from a different cultural background. And some students believing that reporting sexual violence to offices like the SVSBO could escalate the issues, possibly jeopardizing their academic record or their immigration status in Canada. The second question we asked was around the barriers the staff member had identified in IP students engaging in sexual violence educational initiatives on campus, and if they could share with us any areas of challenge. These were some of the main responses that the language used in documents or presentations need to be simplified for students to understand the materials easily. Cultural references like Netflix and chill were not re relatable to IP students. That workshops need to be dynamic, re relatable and creative. For example, to include case scenarios, potentially theater and body movement and personalized messages from survivors and educational materials and workshops. What also came up was that there is a lack of understanding of what sexual violence encompasses. Staff suggested that when students hear the term, their understanding is limited to the act of sexual assault. The third question we asked was related to sharing any observations on newcomer students' based knowledge around sexual health. From these conversations, the perception was that both domestic and IP students have a very low base knowledge around sexual health, though much lower for IP students. There were discussions that students from conservative and religious backgrounds have little information about sexual health, sexuality and sexual acts, and that sex education workshops should be offered for all students, most especially undergrads upon university entry. There was discussion that sex education workshops should include topics like safer sex supplies and its use, contraceptive methods, hormonal and non-hormonal methods, STIs, and so on. And that students should also be taught how to access safe and healthy sexual health information. 
So the second stage of our process was uh, directly connecting with SFU and FIC students. So we created a survey uh, and in that survey, we had demographic questions, questions about their awareness of resources and awareness of the current available education around sexual health. Uh, we asked about their general understanding of sexual health and sexual violence. And we did this survey both online and a paper version. And we handed out the paper version and advertised in places like residents, various different resource centers, and in FIC, um, we're able to actually uh, get into the classrooms and do them within a classroom setting. So at the end of it, we ended up with 427 total responses that were complete enough to be analyzed. Um, and you can see that there's a bit of a difference in breakdown between FIC and SFU. There's a lot higher numbers from FIC, even though it's a much smaller school. And that was because um, we were able to get into a bunch of my classrooms, basically, and we had kind of been in there where we could actually uh, get the students in a classroom. Um, so we ended up with higher numbers from FIC because of that. Uh, so the demographics of our population were uh, that the majority of respondents were under 21. Um, there were a few responses for more mature students, um, but this told us that mostly what we were looking at were was undergraduate data. The countries that were most represented in our surveys uh, were India, China, Bangladesh, Iran, and Pakistan. A majority of our students uh, have learned English as an additional language, which told us that they may be at varying levels of comprehension and confidence in English when it comes to consent and sexual health, but also potentially when it comes to uh, completing the survey. Um, and in terms of living in Canada, the majority of students had lived in Canada for less than a year, although there was a fairly sizable population who had been here for several years or more, although the majority was less than a year. When asked if they were familiar with the definition of sexual violence, the majority of students felt that they were in fact familiar with the term. However, when asked to describe further if they understood the term and what their definition would be, their responses really reflected what staff had shared during the internal consultation process, uh, which was a more limited understanding of what it entailed. When asked about reasons why they would choose not to use SBSBO and FIC Wellness Center services, responses were because of shame and embarrassment, language barriers, and privacy concerns. We asked what topics they would be interested in learning more about related to sexual health. We offered a drop down menu and they could select as many as they wished. Most responses included healthy relationships. For SFU, healthy relationships were closely followed by interest in dating culture, assertiveness and boundaries, consent and safer partying. For FIC, the responses were slightly different and they were likely based on what was being offered at, SF, at FIC at the time. When asked if they were aware of the existence of the SBSBO or FIC's wellness office, responses of yes came in at 68% for SFU and 88% for FIC. If we look at timing, these responses were collected around the one-year benchmark of the SBSBO being open. And for FIC, half of the students indicated knowing about support resources due to the classroom setting. So after we were able to analyze uh, all this uh, information, we were able to come to some conclusions. So the first conclusion was promotion, that promotion needs to be language accessible and it needs to center uh, English language learners specifically. We also need to be highlighting confidential, confidentiality more clearly. Uh, we need to specifically be highlighting the visa concern issue as well as what confidentiality actually looks like within the context of our university. Students also were asking us to centralize information through social media, probably unsurprisingly, so we needed to do a better job of that. 
Um, it also told us that there was a basic understanding of sexual violence, but that there was a definite need to create more a more long-term plan to develop a deeper understanding of what sexual violence really is. It also told us that consent needs to be integrated more fully into wider sexuality uh, education programs and that sexuality education programs themselves need to be uh, developed further. There have been some really excellent action pieces that have stemmed out of the survey. At the SBSBO, we've had our support brochures translated into some key languages, traditional and simplified Chinese, Hindi, Farsi, and Spanish, with uh, Korean, Bengali, and Punjabi coming soon. These languages were selected based on top demographic groups, as well as those identified as particularly vulnerable based on patterns and trends. These translated brochures can be accessed on the SBO website. Our office is also engaged in developing a series of videos aimed to reduce barriers and increase accessibility. The project started before COVID, but the need for these online videos have likely increased within the current context. They are intended for the general student population. However, the project is being led by an international work study student to consider how accessibility needs of the international community can be met throughout the content. The first video which we completed earlier this year is a wayfinding video of the office with a focus on accessibility to the space and that can be found on the SBSBO contact us page. The second video we did was an interview with the two SBSBO case managers. It covers the support services offered, who can access the services, and all the various ways in which someone can link in with us. The intent is for the audience to be able to see the faces of the case managers with a focus on the messaging and the validation that one can connect with us to begin a conversation no matter what their experience is because the perception of whether their experience is enough or uncertainty over the nature of their experience can sometimes be a barrier to access, accessing services. This video is currently being edited uh, and we are considering re-recording on Zoom to reflect the current context with our remote services being offered. The third video is an educational piece led by our SBSBO director and educator, which unpacks the different forms of sexual violence, talks about consent in the Canadian context, and addresses some of the differences between a disclosure and a report, as again, these terms and what they mean uh, could potentially be a barrier to accessing services. That video is currently being recorded on Zoom. And uh, we've been brainstorming a fourth video and actually currently in the scripting phase. That one is gonna be geared specifically for international students, and it will be a conversation between an SBSBO case manager and an international student advisor. The goal is to focus on how confidentiality is handled by the SBSBO, particularly when we may be working with other partners, such as international services for students, to facilitate support for that student, whether it's related to their academic, health, or immigration needs. And we aim to complete recording on Zoom for that one this summer as well. So we've also uh, had one of our mandates be that we share this information. And um, obviously, as I mentioned, when we were talking about our lit review, there isn't a lot of information on uh, how to support students on uh, international pathways. And we really wanted to make sure that we were able to share this and to uh, engage in the dialogue that is kind of already going on about this. So uh, we've been sharing our findings at the NASA Strategies Conference um, that we were able to get in right before things shut down with COVID. Um, these uh, SFU just like internal student affairs meetings, um, this wonderful webinar, um, and in future conferences such as the APAIE conference next year. Um, and hopefully uh, we're able to kind of start some conversations and contribute to some conversations and also be learning from the many other folks doing this work through um, these types of kind of uh, sharing experiences. 
We've also been partnering with uh, different campus programs to expand sexuality, sexual health, and healthy relationship education. Um, it has been very clear to us since even before this survey, but certainly afterwards that there needs to be more sexual health education on campus. Um, so a few of the things we've been working on to further develop that is um, the SVSPO has been developing specifically a cyber safety uh, workshop and some cyber safety content um, that the SVSPO would be, would be using, but also could be used by um, other areas in campus. For example, I would, I plan on using that content in my classrooms for sexual health education. Um, and that really is addressing the current COVID-19 uh, online, online dating kind of um, context that we're in right now. Um, we've also been exploring other institution services and connecting with other institutions um, and also creating a database of resources, uh, specifically resources that are translation focused. Um, as we saw, uh, language accessibility, accessibility is a huge thing. So we want to create uh, as many different resources as we can for our students um, that are as accessible as possible when it comes to language. We've also been uh, working with uh, existing uh, programming and, and different areas in campus to create IP focused programming. Um, so for example, we've been working with residents, Center for Accessible Learning, and various different FIC peer led programs such as orientation um, and leadership training. We've also been uh, recurrently developing a gender and sexuality living learning community, which would hopefully be launching fall 2021. And that will be a collaboration between the FIC and SVSPO to create an LLC that empowers both IP students and domestic students uh, and, in, and strengthens the intersecting knowledge base between sexual health and intercultural communication within the residents community. So that's an exciting project we're working on right now. And in the future, we're hoping to launch a sexual violence support certificate for specifically faculty and staff. And the idea with that is to create a peer program to develop faculty and, a faculty and staff network of champions that could then further support capacity building across their different areas of campus. So that's kind of a, a future project. We haven't quite started on that one yet. Um, but it's something that we're thinking about and, and starting to kind of brainstorm. So we're currently in this taking action phase. Um, this project has been going for a few years now and we started, we got to the taking action phase about last summer. So we've been here for about a year and we're still here. Um, so many of these um, initiatives that we've talked about, we don't, we can't fully report on just how successful they are yet because they're, they're just kind of in the works, but um, this is kind of shows where, what we've chosen to do with the information that we've been given from our students. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. And um, we've got a few references. If you had some questions about um, the information that we've put up here. Um, but I think now we've got lots of time for some questions. So um, Melanie and I will pop our videos back up and hopefully we can have a conversation and, and learn from all y'all about what you have to say about this. Okay, thank you, Melanie and Kate. That's perfect. And now um, I'd like to invite our attendees to share questions and comments, and you can do so um, by typing these into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Great, I can see that we've got our first question. Um, so this is for both of you, Melanie and Kate. Um, could you share a couple of ways you've adapted support services to meet the needs of the international student population in the current COVID-19 context? Sure. We've certainly been trying a few different pieces um, to highlight as well as provide our support services within the current context. We're going to be hosting a virtual meet and greet with the SVSBO case managers for all SFU and FIC community members to learn more about the support services we offer. And over there, we'll be discussing who can access, ways in which um, one can link in with us and so on. Again, it's a way for, to get people familiar with our faces and hopefully invite someone to consider using our services as and when they may be ready. 
Another way in which we've adapted support services is by introducing virtual drop-in hours. Um, we've gone online using Zoom. A third way in which we've adapted, um, and we were doing this before COVID, I would say as well, but it will likely become more important as we move into our fall term with courses online and international students potentially returning home, um, is that we flex our schedule when needed to meet the needs of a client who may be out of province or out of country as much as possible, wherever possible. And I'm really curious to learn from all of you as well on some of the different ways in which you've adapted your support services. So please feel free to share things that you're currently doing in, in the chat box as we go along. Queen, while we're waiting uh, now for those um, prompts to come in, someone had asked in the chat box as well, if you could explain um, what an LLC is. Totally, yeah. Um, so an LLC stands for Living Learning Community, um, and it's, uh, I think it's a relatively newer thing. It's new to SFU anyways. I think we started maybe about four or five years ago um, with uh, developing a cohort of students um, who all live on the same floor in their, in their residence building and they engage in some sort of thematic workshop learning together. So for example, um, at SFU we have like an LLC specifically for BD students, so which is our business school. Um, so for example, all these business students would live on the same floor in residence. And then as well as going to their business classes, they would also engage in extra programming that would kind of develop their skills and their leadership skills and things like that. Um, so there's all sorts of different LLCs. You can kind of pick any theme. We have a, a, a engaged global citizen LLC. Um, we've got, um, and an LLC for Indigenous folks. We've got an LLC uh, that's specifically leadership focused. And so what we're trying to develop is a gender and sexuality LLC. So the idea would be that it'd be a group of anywhere from like 15 to 40 students who all live on the same floor, um, meaning that they kind of all bond and they get to know each other in residence. And then they participate in sometimes weekly or bi-weekly events and workshops um, that are around a theme. And this theme would be gender and sexuality. So the idea is that we would equip a group of students, not only with a strong base of sexual health knowledge, but also with skills in how to become leaders in their own communities, um, how to become peer leaders within the residence community, and how to kind of create a culture of consent um, within their residence community. So that's the idea behind the LLC. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, and our next question is around the virtual drop-in sessions. Um, so Melanie and Kate, could you share a bit about how your virtual drop-in sessions have been operating in the current COVID context and also um, the platform that you're using for the virtual drop-in? Sure, we are using Zoom. SFU went through a process with Zoom to make sure we had all the correct level of encryption and security um, built in. And we offer drop-ins four times a week. We offer morning, um, late morning, as well as late afternoon time slots, about an hour and a half to two hours. And we've, um, you know, did a bunch of communication and promotion around it. Um, and we've been trialing it really for the past, over the past month to see what the response would be. We are finding that clients are still accessing us more through texting us directly, texting, emailing. Um, we suspect that they may be looking at our faces and pictures online and, you know, gauging their comfort level and then connecting directly with either one of us. There are two of us there. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a number of questions about the research, actually, the International Pathways Project. And um, people were wondering, the project was taken on due to an increase in international students at the school or an increase in reports by international students, if that was one of the, the motivations for doing the work. I think one of the, Kate, if you're okay with me responding to this, I think one of the driving motivations was that all are different service areas, international services for students, Fraser International, the SBSPO, we 
we recognize and we were seeing and we were aware and familiar that there are barriers for this vulnerable population, um, even barriers for all students, actually, and then even more so for this population. So we really wanted to learn more about how we could help mitigate and address some of the barriers to make our services more accessible. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Erin is, our office has had some resistance from our international education department in regards to um, sex positive or healthy sexuality training and discussions. Um, and so do you have any advice on how to communicate or push the need uh, for these types of programs? Uh, I would, I mean, having the numbers from students is a really good way to say, listen, this is what students want and need. So if there's any way to do any sort of informal polling of, of, of the student population that you're working with, I guarantee that that's, that population will say, we want sexual health education, we need it. <laughs> um, and if you have you know, a, a poll that says, well, a majority of our students say that they want to need this, and then you can show them the stats on, um, on sexual violence, for example, within IP populations. I, I think it's pretty hard to argue. Um, yeah, that I, having, having, having an idea of what your students want to need, I think help in that situation. So for example, um, when I was just pitching the LLC to, uh, to, the, to residents, um, I came, with, came at it with the stats that we had. I said, this is the percentage of students that say that they want to need sexuality education, and this is a way that we can do that. Can we work together? So I think coming at it with those stats is really helpful. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Melanie. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, our next question is from Eileen, and Eileen just asked, um, oh, well, Eileen met you at the NASPA conference in January, and is asking if you can expand more on what kind of information about confidentiality international students would benefit from learning about in the context of accessing services. Sure, what, what we've been hearing, um, especially during, you know, conversations with our partners in international services for students, and from what we've been seeing in our work with that, that demographic, is students are concerned about what we would be doing with the information um, by them sharing. Is it going to somehow, is it going to be reported to their parents? For example, is it going to go to their parents? Are their parents going to get a call? Or is it going to go to the international center? Um, so basically, really know, learning more about the way in which we work and how we handle confidentiality and our, the approach that we use um, in facilitating services for them. So within, within the context of facilitation, you know, getting their explicit consent um, to release information and what kind of information would be released and then how our offices work together to facilitate impact um, supporting services so that their academics and other areas that have been impacted, we can work with them on around those issues. I think just to add to that, like something to keep in mind um is the language specific education so like for example the word confidential confidential or confidentiality that concept might mean something very different to another person uh, their understanding of what that word actually means you might not have ever heard that word so like as melanie is saying like you know being very transparent about what confidentiality looks like but also just what does that word mean <laughs> what does that word mean in this context I think not taking for granted the language aspect is important as well. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically, if we're talking about impact to their immigration status, that's something that comes up too. So just concern of, is this going to be reported? And, you know, is it going to jeopardize my, my study permit and work permit? Great, thank you. Um, and then our next question um, is from Madison, and it's, uh, has the SVSPO considered creative ways to support a more family or community-based support mechanism 
I'm not sure how that would work, but I'm curious on ways to take into consideration uh, more culturally appropriate ways to provide support, because I think one of the survey answers said that many students um, chose to go to their family or inner circles for support. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I know that with, with the work that we do with clients, um, you know, one of the first things something that we're always talking about and revisiting with each interaction is who are their supports, um, identifying their supports and their resources and their strengths, whether it's external or internal, and looking at ways in which they can lean into that. So if it is within something that they already practice where they are sharing with family or with friends, if that is something that they're comfortable with and they want to do, um, facilitating those conversations of, of how it can happen and what it can look like. Great, hey, thank you. Um, and Ashley was wondering if this research project identified strategies for building capacity and knowledge with faculty members and TAs on how to support international students regarding sexual violence, because often faculty uh, may be the first point of contact for international students, given the barrier to accessing support services. But sometimes faculty aren't unaware of the unique barriers that international students face, um, and they might not perceive academic struggles with other struggles. And yeah, so they're wondering if, um, they're just curious if the research identified the need for online videos and workshops as well in different languages beyond the pamphlets. I definitely, I think probably both of us can answer this. Um, I do a lot of education at FIC specifically for faculty uh, because there is that massive need and because we want to equip our, our teachers and our instructors with um, the ability to have that conversation if a student wants to have it um, and to feel comfortable with that. And from doing those workshops, I can say that there is a huge need still um, and that one workshop isn't enough. Um, and that there does need to be more of an effort when it comes to um, um, like pro-D days, for example, or pro-D opportunities. Um, there does need to be more of a sustained effort in order to develop that because it's, I think it's the kind of thing where my experience is that it's like a one-off workshop um, that, that schools might offer and it needs to be something um, more than that. Um, and we hope to kind of develop that with the, the certificate for faculty and staff, um, but that wouldn't be every faculty and staff, that would just be some. Um, but I do think that's a huge area that, um, that was identified in the survey and that we also, I definitely see as an instructor, um, that there's a huge need for that and that um, it needs to be a continued and ongoing effort rather than a one-off workshop. I don't know, Melanie, if you have other experiences. Yeah, and I think, you know, finding ways in which we can build it into the expectations of that community, rather than something that's offered as a one off, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think we had some questions as well about that certificate for staff. So once that's complete, uh, will that be made available for other institutions as well? And in a free or paid capacity? Great question that I do not know the answer to. Do you, Melanie? No. <laughs> that would be great. Though. Well, we're definitely we'll, we'll put that in mind as we we're just. My understanding is that it's it's not my baby. It's it's someone else's uh, in the in the team. But my understanding is that uh, we're like just at the initial process of starting this. So it's good to know. I'm going to put that on the list of things to consider. <laughs> Great, and I see that we have a few more questions. Um, and folks are wondering if the slides will be shared after. And uh, yes, so the recording will be made available on the website along with our transcript. And um, Ian's question uh, for you, Melanie and Kate, were um, following your surveying efforts with the students, did you see more engagement from students with the SVSPO, as in more students disclosing their experiences with sexual violence? We did not um, 
look for or notice any correlation. I think that's what I would have to say. Um, it definitely, in terms of who responded to the survey, we don't know that either. We, we looked for responses, we advertised it online. Um, we had physical um, hard copies available um, in key areas of campus, like in residence um, at International Services for Students. Um, so we, we don't know if folks responded because it was you know, a term or an office that they were already familiar with and it caught their attention, or if you know, they responded to it because of the incentives that were offered. Um, so we didn't notice a correlation with um, disclosures after the survey was conducted. And I know that it was slightly different at FIC and Kate, maybe you can speak to that because it was, it was the classroom setting. Yeah, so like at FIC, we have a mandatory like well-being course essentially that includes a lot of sexual health education that students take in their first semester of study, like when they first arrive in Canada. Um, and that includes a lot of information on connecting to resources, including our wellness center, which is where like our counselors work. Um, and so there's, yeah, there's a different level. We didn't notice an, an, an increase, um, but we have noticed an increase in, um, in the, accessing the wellness office for sexual violence and other experiences um, when we advertised the wellness office more. <laughs> so we started having our counselors actually coming into the classroom so the students can meet them and say, okay, this is what a counselor looks like. Most of our students have never um, used counseling resources before. Um, so when we started bringing uh, those counselors into the classroom, wellness access went up. Um, but that didn't actually correspond to the survey or corresponded to just our practices in the classroom and how students were able to see, oh yeah, that's who I'd be talking with. Okay, I feel a bit more comfortable now, which I think speaks to the video that Melanie, you're making with SVSPO of meeting the case managers and mm -hmm. having that face and then being able to connect with the person. Yeah, I think that's so important. Just, you know, it helps towards pave the way for the beginning of building rapport. Uh, I do find that we hear a lot of, my friend told me about your office um, and connection through word of mouth, mouth, that seems to be a really key way in which um, clients access our services. Great, thank you. Um, and we have another question. Um, it's, have you found a way students prefer communication and information, Melanie, from SVSPO to be delivered? Does social media seem to be the most beneficial way to reach students? Definitely, I would say. And actually, I'm just pulling up um, our survey results because we did have a question in there about ways in which they would like to hear about, um, receive information on our support services. So email came in at 54%. Newsletters, 25%, social media, 50%, in class, 31%, from a friend, about 17%. I do think it's worth mentioning that students wanted social media, but also so that in COVID-19, um, it might not be happening yet, but uh, I guarantee you it will happen in the next few semesters, whereas more students are leaving Canada to attend to do their online courses. And so social media isn't as an accessible platform. So for example, I'm teaching classes to students who do, do not live in Canada right now, who, who are in their first semester of online study at our school. Um, and many of those students live in geo-blocked um, countries, right? Where you can't access Instagram or you can't access Facebook. So just to keep that in the back of your mind that when you're working with uh, IP students in COVID-19, <laughs> social media, um, you have to think carefully about that and what platforms you use and uh, what other platforms you make available instead of just using Instagram and Facebook, for example. Thank you. Um, I think we might have time for just three more questions. Um, so it's how do you address international students' concerns if they're concerned about whether their study permit will be impacted by their struggles? We definitely check in on their openness and comfort level in connecting with an international student advisor. Um, with our campus partners, International Services for Students. 
if it's a case where they're not comfortable accessing directly and engaging directly with their consent, um, we facilitate them receiving the responses um, that, that they need to make informed to be aware and to be informed so basically if we offer facilitation of setting up the appointment um, supporting them in person if needed and attending and if they're not open to that but they would like access to that information we find ways in which we can pose those questions to our colleagues and get the answers for them okay thank you melody um, so our next question is, can our panelists share a few creative dynamic strategies that the SVSPO and FIC have used to engage International Pathways students on sexual education? Sorry, the question was just uh, like ways that we engage students in sexuality education? Like creative ideas and dynamic strategies that you use to bring students into the conversation on um, sexual education. Um, Something that I've been uh, using, as I mentioned, I'm teaching only online right now, and almost all my students don't live in Canada right now. Um, and so I've been using Padlet, um, which is an online platform that kind of acts as social media, um, but it lets, it lets students have conversations with each other. And so um, one of the ways that I've been approaching sexual health education online is to turn a lot of the education over to students to be having conversations with each other rather than me talking about my context that my students can't relate to at all because they've never been to Canada. So um, I've been using this platform Padlet to, to have students have conversations with each other, giving them discussion questions, um, giving them a little tiny thing to research and then to post about it. And they can post videos, they can comment on each other's posts, um, they can create threads and discussions just like you would, basically it's like an Instagram. Um, and I've really enjoyed doing that. It's probably one of the more successful tools I've used in sexual health education in the last couple of years. Um, and it's provided a really awesome platform for students who are living in completely different countries to start developing intercultural communication skills and sexual health skills at the same time and, and to be developing them together. Um, and they're really just learning from each other and I'm just kind of moderating essentially. So that's one tool. Um, if, you, if you are working with students online in any way that I'd highly recommend um, checking out, or I'm sure there's similar platforms as other than Padlet, but um, it's enabled me to kind of step out of the picture and have students learn from each other um, and me to just kind of guide that process. So that's one thing that I've been really enjoying using lately. And Kate, share the, the name of the platform again and also type it into the chat box um, for our attendees. Yeah, it's Padlet, P-A-D-L-E-T. It does cost money, just heads up. Um, I can't remember the cost right now, um, but yeah, it's basically saved my online teaching for me. I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Kate. And perhaps our very last question, um, as a mindful of time, is have you noticed any differences in the needs of international pathway students on sexual health education in the COVID-19 context? Yes. <laughs> um, Melanie, do you have... Do you yeah, to I, you know, speaking with our educator, students have definitely shown increased interest and curiosity to learn more about healthy practices related to online sexual activities, such as sexting, video sex, sharing photos while they're social distancing with either their partners or their dates. Um, so that has definitely increased uh, interest in that realm um, since COVID. I think what I've been noticing from, pre from a prevention education perspective is just the fact that, yeah, students are starting to be not just all in one city. Um, and that creating, uh, creating sexual health education that has to rely not on understanding any sort of shared social context. So normally when I do sexual health education, we can all kind of acknowledge, yeah, this is what it's like here. And people have witnessed and experienced that, even if it's different from what it was back home. Um, whereas now you're doing that education with students who have different levels of experience with the culture that is on the West Coast, for example. Um, so 
I've noticed just a difference in how you, how I, um, the, the perspective that I take on sexual health and the context that it exists in and really trying to take it out of context as much as possible. Great, thank you. Thank you, Melanie and Kate. We've had a really great discussion today and um, I just want to honor our one hour commitment. So again, thank you, Melanie and Kate for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. We've learned a lot and the recording will be available on our website in a few days. Um, I also want to thank our participants for joining us and for sharing with us today. We um, appreciate and take inspiration from your commitment to addressing gender-based violence on campus and we feel very lucky to be able to uh, work alongside each and every one of you. So thank you again and a kind reminder to please complete the evaluation form and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar in July. Bye, everyone.